We're going to look in 1 Thessalonians. One of Jesus' promises was, I will come again. Whenever I think of Christmas, I always, for some reason, think of Jesus is coming again. He came once, he's going to come again. And the, the question I would pose to you this morning is, are you ready if Jesus should come today? If Jesus were to come today, are, are you where you want to be before God and Jesus Christ? Uh, the book of Thessalonians was written to Christians who were saved out of wicked pagan culture there in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul was encouraging them to live holy lives. Uh, if you look at chapter 1, uh, verses, verse 9, uh, the first se sentence, he says, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. He, he's, he's saying, your testimony, people have noticed your testimony and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. You see, he's saying they're, they're living for the Lord because they know Jesus is coming again. They're, they've understood Jesus could come today. Have you ever thought about that? Does that influence what you do? It, it should. Well, then... In chapter 2, verse uh, 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They had received the Bible. They believed it was God's word, as it is. He says that's, that's exactly the truth. They honored and obeyed God's word. Do we? Do you this morning? Is that the attitude you have? Jesus could come today. Am I, am I living what God has said? In uh, chapter 3, verse 8, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. He goes on down, verse 12, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he says, For this purpose... He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. When you stand before God, uh, you know, what's going to be your, your standing before the Lord? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were standing for the Lord. They were looking for Jesus' return. And they were living lives that were different than those around them. You know, we live in a world where everybody in some way tries to be the same. I remember when I was a kid, that we had all these hippies. You, you ever heard about hippies? They're, they're all, most of them are dead now. Their grandparents are old. But, and the strange thing was, they wanted to be different, so they were all the same. <laughs> we used to take people down to San Francisco and show them the hippies. You know, that was our, that was our tourist attraction, you know. Uh, most of them became very conservative later, later in life. But, you know, we, we tend to want to be the same. God says, when you become a Christian... You stepped across the line. You're, if you're going to be like Christ, you're going to be different. In, in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, it says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. He said, I've been teaching you how you should live as a Christian. I hope you'll keep getting stronger and stronger in that. Uh, in, in verse 3, he says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. I was reading that this morning, I thought, you know, we, we live in a world of fornication, don't we? People think nothing uh, of having sexual relationships outside of marriage. They just think it's the norm. Uh, God says, that's not how we live as Christians. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Your vessel's your body, all right? In sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now when he talks about the Gentiles, he's just talking about non-Christians. He's saying, we're not to be the same as the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Jesus is coming again. When he left, he said, I'm coming again. I'm going to receive you unto myself. Uh, these people in Thessalonica were people that lived for God. They knew Jesus was coming again. 
And what a blessing it is as we, as we think about that fact this morning. Let me give you a couple of things here. In chapter 4, God comforts troubled Christians with that thought. Uh, look at uh, verse 13 of chapter 4. We're getting kind of a bird's eye view, first of all, here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, asleep means dead, all right? That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That, that's an old English word, prevent means to precede them. They're not going to be left behind just because they've died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's a comfort in knowing Jesus is coming again. What a blessing to, to think about it. You know, they were worried that the Christians who died weren't, they, they didn't know what was going to happen. So Paul said, listen, don't worry. They're going to rise first. People have said, you know, they're, they're lower down. They, they've got further to go. So God's given them a head start, you know. Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. And he uses a, a word there, caught up. In the Latin Bible, which I've never read, but uh, I don't read Latin, it's the word rapture. You probably heard the word rapture. We use that because it doesn't sound that great to say the great caught up. <laughs> the great rapture, that sounds good. You know? uh, rapture, that's, that's the Latin word for caught up. We're going to be caught up. Uh, before trouble comes, before uh, the tribulation comes, God pulls us out. That's normal procedure, by the way, when you declare war. You pull your, your people out of the area, and then, man, you start bombing and attacking, and, and, and go, war breaks out. And God is going to catch us up. God says there's comfort in that. No matter how much trouble is going on in our world today, listen, before the day of the Lord occurs, before his judgment falls, we'll be taken home to be with him. And when he comes back at the second coming, like he says there, we'll come with him. Notice that as, as we, we read by there. Uh, not looking at the right place right now, so I can't find it. But uh, we're going to come with him at the, at the second coming. God comforts troubled Christians with, with this. But the chapter we're going to look at is chapter 5. And God troubles comfortable Christians with this, this one. All right? Uh, sometimes we're troubled Christians that need comfort. Sometimes we're comfortable Christians that need to get a bit uh, stirred up. And uh, in chapter 5, let me read starting in verse 1. Listen, I, I believe in preaching the Bible. All right? Uh, when you come to church, bring your Bible. You can bring it electronically. You can bring it. Well, don't bring a scroll, <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, bring your Bible and, and look at it. We've got spare ones there. Uh, you don't have to believe me, but you do need to believe God's word. And, and as we look at it this morning, we're going to look at the first part of, of chapter five, particularly. Um, and, and let me start reading in, in verse one. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now that, that term, day of the Lord, means a, the time of judgment. It doesn't mean a 24-hour day, it means a, a time. Verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with, with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that... Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Now he's saying there, Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? Are you ready? Now, two things I want us to look at this morning. What you need to know and what you need to do. 
pretty simple. The, the basic that you need to know is Jesus is coming again. Now there's some, some sub points we need to look at. Uh, he's told us everything we need to know. He says that in verse 4. It says, you're not in darkness. Uh, verse 9, uh, God hath not appointed us to, uh, to wrath, but to obtain salvation uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we can know the Lord. We can know we're saved. Uh, he, he says in 1 John, uh, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, see, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's not how you feel about it. It doesn't make any difference how I feel about it. Uh, sometimes how I feel will depend on whether I've had my, my latest coffee or not, or how my blood sugar's doing, or, uh, you know, who's pulled in front of me in, on the freeway. But uh, uh, the truth of the matter is what God says. And faith is just believing what God has said and acting upon it. We can be ready for Jesus coming again because he's told us, and he's told us the way. He said he is the way. One of the things we, we need to know is that there's coming a rapture. God is going to catch out those that are saved. Now, we, we've been Wednesday nights, I mentioned, looking at the book of Revelation. I, I've been reminded once again how much the book of Revelation is about judgment. It's mainly about judgment. And God has said that as Christians, we're not going to face the wrath to come. We're not part of that. We're in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, you know, there's some great things going to be going on in heaven. Well, all hell is breaking loose. Well, it's not actually hell. That's even worse. But uh, terrible things are happening on earth. Judgment. Now, the, the strange thing about it, yeah, in politics you have, I think they call them spin doctors. Uh, Satan's got his spin doctors. And when the rapture happens, uh, boy, they're, they're going to they're gonna work that. I've heard, now I, I can't verify this, I've heard that there's a new age prophecy that Christians will be removed so that the world can have peace. I, I, can, I can believe that. And I can, I can just hear the world saying, boy, they, they just weren't in tune with the universe, and so the universe has just swallowed them up. They're just gone. And they'll have some reason why Christians are gone. And uh, you know, on they'll go. And Satan will say, listen, now we have peace. While... Terrible judgments are happening. You know, there's some amazing things going on right now in the world. A lot of them you never hear about. There's some weird and wonderful and awful things happening. And, and most of them we never hear about because that, that doesn't fit in with their spin. That doesn't fit in with their entertainment programs they call news. <laughs> you need to understand something about our world today, folks. We don't get news. We get entertainment. And don't, don't believe what you hear, most of it. But when God says that he's going to pull us out of this earth, listen, you need to know that you're one of God's people. You don't want to face the wrath to come. The wrath to come. It'll not only be God's wrath, it'll be Satan's wrath as well. Man, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant time on earth. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, it talks about how the Thessalonians were waiting, that they were living and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, they were looking forward to being with Jesus. Jesus has said uh, that there, there is coming a time when he will take us unto himself. He's prepared a place for us and so on. But the other thing that we need to see is not only are Christians going to be safe, if you don't know the Lord, judgment is coming. That's what I mentioned there in verse 2 and other places. The Bible talks about the day of the Lord. Listen, the day of the Lord is, it's not like having a, a, a fun time at, at, at school or something, you know. It's, a, it's the, the time of, of judgment. In, um, in fact, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, God calls it his vengeance. So some of you would know Romans where he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. He's saying, we don't, we don't need to seek vengeance on people. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. I mentioned as Christians, boy, they were troubled. You know, they wondered what was happening. They were being persecuted. He says, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. 
and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You know, people think about Christianity, they, they think of some weak, anemic, little fairy floss kind of a attitude. Listen, God is going to wreak havoc on this, this world. And in fact, later on we'll see that he's going to turn loose the things that are holding the world together and it's just going to disappear. It's going to melt. Uh, we need to understand the day of the Lord is coming and it's God's vengeance. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and, and verse 10, again he uses that phrase, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The other night we had a, a thunderstorm. And you know, sometimes that can be really loud. That's nothing like when God turns the universe loose. The, the, the word there, melt, it, it's repeated then in verse 11. He asks the question, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Melt, dissolved, it means to untie, to loosen. The things holding the molecules together, the things holding the, uh, the world together, God's going to turn them loose. What's that thing they, they talk about? Saying dark matter. I think we're going to discover right then what dark matter is. It's God holding everything together by the word of his power. And in the day of the Lord, man, it, it's, it's going to be taken away. And he asks the question, seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. What kind of people should we be? Listen, if you're living for this world, what a waste of time. You can collect all this world that you want. It's not going to last into eternity. We need to understand that there's, there's an eternity that is going to be ours. It's either going to be with God or separated from God. Jesus said he's coming again. We're going to have to give an account of what we've done with Jesus Christ. God gave his only son. I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't give my son for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wouldn't give either one of them. Uh, I wouldn't give my daughter for you. But God gave his only begotten son. He is, he is the everlasting father. I mean, it, it gets a little confusing sometimes. But God himself lived and died so that we could be saved. And, and our choice then is, well, what am I going to do about it? What I need to know is that he's the Savior. I need to know that he's, uh, he's sufficient, he's enough for my needs. You know, God's day is coming. The world doesn't expect it. Satan is so deceptive, he, when it starts, he's going to call it peace. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, that's what he says. Uh, they'll say, peace and safety. You know, the world will be falling apart. You, you, you read Revelation, the trumpets and the, the, the seals and the vials and all the things that, that God is doing. Uh, Satan is going to have people saying, oh, this is, this is great. And he gives the, uh, several contrasts here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The first one we've mentioned is knowledge versus ignorance. He says to us, you, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Folks, we don't have to be ignorant of what God is doing. God's written it down. We can know. But you know, the world is ignorant. Many of them think there is no God. I, I'm finding it's very hard to have a logical conversation with many people. You know, when, when a person doesn't have a foundation for what they're thinking and saying and doing, it, it, thoughts go everywhere. You know, when you don't believe in God, it doesn't mean that you're going to be careful about what you believe. It means you can believe anything. You can believe in witches. You can believe in moon being, out of cheese, being made out of cheese. I mean, you'd be amazed what people believe. Knowledge versus ignorance. And, and it's our responsibility to tell folks. The truth. In, in their situation, God compares his coming to a thief in the night. Now, so far in my life, I've never had a thief announce to me, uh, I'm going to rob you. I've been robbed a few times. Uh, we had our car stolen one time. Uh, we've had somebody break into our home. Uh, th they didn't send a letter. Yeah, you know, I've had the electricity company say, now we're going to turn the electricity off Tuesday at 10 a.m. You, you ever had that happen? Or I keep getting ones from my phone company saying they're doing something. They, they never seem to do anything. And, I've gotten where I ignore them, but uh, 
You know, a thief doesn't say, no, at midnight, I'll, I'll just let you know, I'll be breaking into your home and, uh, you know, taking whatever I, I want. So just, just to let you, no, it doesn't do that. And, and that's the way it is for a lost person. It's not that God is a thief, but he's just saying, he's going to come when they, they don't expect it. We've been informed. Uh, we need to be ready. Jesus could come today. I, I think that's a thought we need to think regularly. Maybe every day. <laughs> Jesus could come today. Uh, if you're saved, glad day. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now we wait differently. We don't wait like for a thief. We wait like an expectant mother. Men, we get to be expectant mothers. Uh, we know it's coming, we just don't know when. My wife had three children, and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty exciting times. Uh, you, you know it's coming, people... It's so funny, they congratulate you. Congratulations. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, and uh, as the time goes by, you know, you think, oh, it's getting closer. It, it really gets tense if you go past the time the doctor, you know, he said, oh, it's going to come, you know, April, whatever. And, oh, well, it's May. <laughs> and it gets, you know, pretty exciting. But you know it's coming. You're an expectant mother. Uh, you've had things like that where you're waiting for something and uh, looking forward to it. You, you know it's coming. Uh, expectancy versus surprise, he talks, talks about here in verses 3 and 4. Uh, Sudden destruction it cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Uh, we're not ignorant. We shouldn't be. Uh, we're not surprised that he's coming again. We're expecting it. We're looking forward to it. In uh, verse 5, he talks about the difference between light and darkness. We're not in the dark on this. We're in the light. You're children of the light, children of the day. Uh, let me encourage you, if you're a Christian, listen, be a person of the day. D don't stay up all night playing video games and doing stupid things. Be a person of the day. Go to bed. Get up. <laughs> uh, some of you don't know that 6 o'clock in the morning actually exists. It's just a theory to you. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, just get up and confirm, yeah, the world is still there at 6 in the morning. Uh, be a person of the day. Now, I'm not saying you got to get up early, but uh, listen, don't be a person who wastes your time at night and then is groggy during the day. Uh, I just threw that in for free, okay? Jesus could come today. Uh, don't worry. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, light versus darkness. We need to be people of the day. Thieves often operate at night. He talks about that. Drunks are often drunk at night. Quite often when you hear of somebody getting hit by a car because they're drunk, it's usually at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. Get beat up because they're coming out of a pub, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. Uh, they're not people of the morning, they're people of the night. That's when trouble happens. Uh, I mentioned our car was stolen one time. They, they did find it. The thieves had taken the interior light out so that whenever they opened the door, the light wouldn't go on. I guess they didn't, weren't smart enough to know how to turn it off. Uh, light versus darkness. We're people of the light. We're not people of, of darkness. He says as, as well, we're people that need to be awake and not asleep. Right. What is it there? They, they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken, are drunken in the night. Verse 6, let us not sleep, but let us watch. We're not people that are just kind of letting things happen. We're people, we're awake. We're supposed to be. And, and actively seeking the, the, the will of God. Um, we're people of the day. He talks about the difference between soberness and drunkenness. Uh, we need to be people who are sober. Uh, it's not just not drinking alcohol. We need to be people who are serious about life. You know, people who are into drugs and alcohol, uh, man, they'll do all kinds of things. They're very confident. Yeah, I can drive the car, no worries, as they kill your family. Um, that's not the way we're to be. We're, our confidence is to be in the Lord. We're to be people who are, who are sober. Uh, if you're saved, uh, you need to have a serious attitude toward life. In 1 Peter, he says, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Listen, Jesus could come today. What good will it do us to be fools? We need to be wise people who are, are following the Lord. In uh, Colossians chapter 3 and, uh, and verse 1, Get back to it here. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, 
Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. We need to be people of the day, people who are, are serious about life. You know, if you're an unsaved person this morning, uh, you have a false security. You know, Australia has a, a, a theme, generally. She'll be right, mate. Listen, it won't be right if you don't know Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. You know, people say, Oh, this has happened before. Don't worry about it. You'll be, she'll be right. It'll all turn out. Jesus could come today. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, it won't be right. You need to have that hope, your hope in him. The greatest contrast he gives there is in, in verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians 5. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast, salvation and wrath. I know which side I want to be on. I don't want to face God's vengeance, God's wrath. I want to be a part of God's salvation. And salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. God's told us what we need to know. Now, in a sermon on a Sunday morning, you're not going to hear everything that the Bible says. But we, we know the basics from God's Word. Uh, we know that Jesus is coming again. We know that when He comes, He'll judge sin and what we've done with His salvation. And we know from the Bible that He is the way of salvation. He's the only way of salvation. You know, the devil likes to make things complicated and confuse the issue. He wants to get your eyes off Jesus and on anything else. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Very simple. There's simplicity in Christ. We're the sinners. He's the Savior. He can save anyone who'll come to Him in faith. He can save you. He's sufficient. What do I need to know? Well, I need to know He's the Savior, I'm the sinner, and I can be saved today. What do I need to do? Well, if I'm not saved, I need to be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. Jesus could come today. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, listen, you would have no more time to think about it. I know sometimes you've got to think about things and so on. But listen, some of you thought and you thought and you thought, and now is the time of salvation. Now! There's no other time that you can be saved than now. If you're not saved, Jesus could come today. If you are saved, let me give you some things that we can do as, as Christians. In, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast. You know, as Christians, we need to stand fast. That just means to live by faith in God's word. Uh, in Ephesians, he, he talks about standing. Ephesians chapter five, uh, 6 be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In, uh, in verse 13, take unto you the whole armor that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Like he said there in, uh, in Thessalonians, uh, we, we do it by putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. In Ephesians, he said, above all, taking the shield of faith. We need to be people of faith. Uh, we need to stand fast. In 2 Corinthians 1, he says, for by faith ye stand. You know, when you have a, a choice between believing God and not believing God, make a habit of believing God. You know, sometimes it, it's, it's easy sometimes to say, oh, well, I'll just do whatever. no. There's choices in life. Stand fast. Every little decision. Stand fast. Live by faith. Secondly, don't quit. You know, sometimes it can get hard along the way. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and, uh, and verse 1. There's several times he makes statements like this. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we faint not. Don't faint. Don't faint. Have you ever had somebody faint in, in the crowd? 
Man, it messes everybody up, you know. Oh, help that person. Uh, don't faint. Don't be the one that distracts everybody else from what needs to be done. Don't, uh, what we're saying here is just keep doing what you know is right. There's real temptations many times to just throw up our hands and, and give up. Listen, just keep doing what you know is right. Just keep doing it. Uh, verse 16 of that same chapter, he says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. If you know Christ is your Savior, listen, you have the Holy Spirit to help you. The Holy Spirit is God. You have God to help you. We don't have to faint. We don't have to give up. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, we have help in this. Don't quit. Be faithful in your family. Be faithful in your church. Yeah, be faithful in your community and in the things that, that God has, has called you to. Uh, so live by faith. Don't quit. Thirdly, live a holy life. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, he makes a statement. It's very startling, I think. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, there's, there's his appearing, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Jesus is coming again. We need to be living holy lives. Uh, live for Jesus. There's a verse in, in 2 Timothy where he says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he's been talking about different sins, he says, If we'll purge ourselves, wash ourselves from those, he'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, fitting for the master's use. Can you imagine if the, if the queen came? We wouldn't offer her a dirty dish. <laughs> Can't see her coming here, but <laughs> anyway, uh, we would treat her with respect. And the Lord is worthy of our best, sanctified and fitting, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. That's our life. We need to be holy for the Lord's sake, not for self-righteousness, not to brag or boast or put ourselves above someone else. We're not above anyone else, but for, for God's sake, for, for his, his purposes. And not only to, uh, to do it for Jesus, but to be like Jesus. In, in 2 Peter, he said that Jesus came... And, to give us the example that we need. 1 Peter 2.21 Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And the next verse says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That's the example he gave us. To be like Jesus, we're often given choices. It was impressed upon me this year that how often we... The Bible uses an expression, we harden our hearts. Something comes up and we think, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. And we know it's wrong. Or, I'm not doing that. And we know it's right. We harden our hearts. We harden our hearts against a person. Oh, I don't like how they treat me. I don't, I don't like what they said. I don't like who they are. And we harden our hearts. And God says we need to be living like Jesus. Aren't you glad Jesus has not hardened his heart against you? If anyone could, I mean, he's perfect. He's sinless. We're not. But he doesn't. He has a tender heart toward us, such that he loved us in our sin. We need to live holy lives. You know, as you, as you make choices about other people, choose to love, choose to forgive. As you make choices about what you're going to do with your time, with your day, with, with your work, with all the decisions you're making in life, choose holiness. Choose to live for the Lord. Jesus could come today. There's a, a song we often sing, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. That's the attitude that we should have. And then finally, Jesus is coming again. We need to win those that we want to see saved. You know, there, there's coming a day when we'll no longer be able to tell people, you can trust the Lord. The time of salvation will be past. We all have loved ones. And sometimes they, well, those nearest and dearest to us are the hardest to witness to. It starts with your life, but it also has to do with our words. 
We need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with, with those that we love. You know, the time is short. We read there in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, they shall not escape. They shall not escape. When God's vengeance breaks out in this world, the lost people will, will suffer the vengeance of God. Jesus is coming again. It, it's, a, it's a hard thing to think about in some ways, but you know, as Christians, we can be encouraged. Jesus coming again, what a blessing. What a blessing. Take it out of this world of woe. Uh, up above the clouds we'll go. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know There's a wonderful thought to think of. Uh, I'm finding we were too, what was that phrase about old people in this morning in the Sunday school? Uh, they were afflicted or something like that. Well stricken. well stricken in years. Man, I'm getting stricken every day in my years. I'm tired of it. But uh, listen, someday we'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. We'll be with the Lord. We'll be like the Lord. No more temptation to, to sin. Uh, I'm looking forward to Jesus coming again in, in that aspect. But you know, if you're not saved, be warned. Be warned. There's no hope without Jesus Christ. What a warning. Jesus is coming again. The day of the Lord will, will happen. There's a couple of verses I wanted to, to quit with. Hebrews 9, 27. You probably know this verse. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, when you die, you're going to stand before the Lord. You're going to give an account. We're talking about Jesus coming again. You might not die. You know, Jesus might come, and you're going to have to give an account. The next verse says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's going to deal with sin. Those who, who, who don't have Christ, who are not, their sin is not covered by the blood, that'll be, that'll be dealt with. That'll be taken away. And when Jesus comes again, he'll receive his people un, unto himself. What a blessing. You know, without Jesus, there's no hope. But with Jesus, there's, there is hope. There is salvation. You know, I've often wondered, why would a person go home without Jesus? Why would you face life without Jesus? Now, he created you. He loves you. Now, he provided the remedy for your sin. He died for you, rose again, and offers it to you freely at his great cost. Like we read in 1 Thessalonians 5.10, who died for us. Now, this morning, let me encourage you. Know the Lord. Don't be ignorant. You don't have to be ignorant. God has, has written it out so that we can know are you ready if Jesus should come today? Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you're not saved and need to trust Christ. You can do that this morning. You can ask the Lord to, to forgive you and tell him that you believe him. Ask him to be your savior. Maybe you're a Christian and, and there's, uh, there's areas of, of life that you're you're not right with God, not right with people. Father, help us. We, uh, we need your help. Father, you're the only way of salvation, and we, we turn to you for that. We turn to you for help in our lives. And Lord, I pray that if there are those this morning that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would convict them and draw them to yourself. Help us as Christians, Lord, to be forgiving and kind. Help us to be godly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.